Easter, traditional Christianity's most important celebration. Beginning with Palm Sunday, all of the passion and pageantry of the Easter season will be on display as millions of believers around the world relive the final days of Jesus. Over the centuries, many traditions have been handed down to commemorate Easter. But what would Christ make of all of this celebration? And what did the early Christians do to remember their Savior? This week on The World Tomorrow, David Hume. Once again, we've come to the time of year regarded by many as the most important Christian celebration, Easter. During the next few days, hundreds of millions of people will take part in rituals and ceremonies marking the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Of course, for Christianity to have any meaning at all, Christ must have both died and then been raised from the dead. The Apostle Paul, writing around 55 A.D., put special emphasis on this when he said in 1 Corinthians 15, verses 17 and 19, If Christ is not risen, your faith is futile. You are still in your sins. If in this life only we have hope in Christ, we are of men the most pitiable. Today's program, The Plain Truth About Easter, is the first of a special two-part presentation. It's the real story behind the remarkable events that took place in Judea over 1,900 years ago. Some very interesting facts and details about that crucial time have been assembled, and we'll present them this week and next. Most of us are familiar with the Easter tradition in general, but the way the Easter celebration has come down to us today is little known. For example, you might be surprised to know that Easter is nowhere commanded in the Bible. It's true that in the King James Version of the Bible, the word Easter appears in Acts 12 and verse 4. But here, the Greek word Pascha is mistranslated. Pascha actually means not Easter, but Passover, and refers to that biblical celebration. So where did Easter come from? And more importantly, we might ask, if Christ were on earth today, how would he feel about the way his death and resurrection is observed? As we begin our look at what's thought to be the most significant week in the Christian calendar, we need to review the scope of this annual commemoration. During the Easter season, churches overflow with sincere people who want to mark, in some form or other, the resurrection of Jesus. Those who may not darken the door of a church much at other times throughout the year will make sure to attend on this occasion. Some services are simple. Others are very elaborate. In the United States and other countries, worshipers attend special Easter services at sunrise to hear once again the triumphant proclamation, He is risen. For many, it's a time for family get-togethers. After the traditional church service, families and friends often gather to watch young children scamper about hunting for colored eggs. Some roll them down grassy lawns. Some provide brightly decorated baskets filled with candies and chocolates. Prominent, of course, is the Easter rabbit. According to ancient tradition, rabbits are supposed to lay eggs for good boys and girls at this time of year. Then, after the egg hunt is finished, many families will sit down for the traditional Easter ham and other dishes. But to get a broader perspective on Easter, let's ask our question again. How would Christ feel about all of this? Would he agree or disagree? For the most part, we accept traditions without really knowing where they come from. But the Bible requires us to take a very different approach. Notice this principle in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 and verse 21. Test all things. Hold fast what is good. So today, let's look back a few centuries and see how today's traditional Easter observances became accepted. As our regular viewers know, on this program, we don't shy away from telling you what honest research has revealed. 
so be prepared for some surprises. This is a volume of the Encyclopedia Britannica, the 11th edition. It was published in 1910 and has a unique reputation among scholars. Of all of the editions of the Britannica, this one is prized for its theological and literary content. For that reason, it's a very good starting point. Here are some very interesting comments from the section on Easter. Now, this is a bombshell for the casual observer of Easter traditions. There is no indication of the observance of the Easter festival in the New Testament or in the writings of the Apostolic Fathers. The article goes on, the ecclesiastical historian Socrates, that's not the famous philosopher, states with perfect truth that neither the Lord nor his apostles enjoin the keeping of this Easter celebration or any other festival. Now that's quite a shock. Neither Christ nor the apostles kept or taught others to observe Easter. Surprising but true, many historians and researchers have actually linked the name and modern customs of Easter with ancient pagan rituals. Easter is a word used in the Germanic languages to refer to the celebration of the arrival of spring. The English church historian Bede concluded in the 7th century AD that the word Easter was taken from a pagan goddess of dawn named Eostere, who features in pagan Anglo-Saxon mythology. But some of the symbols of modern-day Easter, like rabbits and eggs, go back much further. They have their ancient roots in pagan fertility rites and other practices. So if the early apostles and Christians didn't originate or observe Easter as we know it today, what did they observe? Again, a quote from the section on Easter in the 11th edition of the Encyclopedia Britannica. The first Christians continued to observe the Jewish festivals, though in a new spirit, as commemorations of events which those festivals had foreshadowed. History and the Bible confirm that the early Christians kept not Easter, but a modification of the Old Testament Passover, following what Christ had taught his disciples at the Last Supper. We pick up the account in Luke chapter 22, verses 7 and 8. Then came the day of unleavened bread, when the Passover must be killed. And he, Christ, sent Peter and John, saying, Go and prepare the Passover for us, that we may eat. As they were eating the Passover meal together, Christ introduced a new element into the Passover observance. We see that in verses 19 and 20. And he took bread, gave thanks, and broke it, and gave it to them, saying, This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Likewise, he also took the cup after supper, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is shed for you. So here is what Christ said should be done to observe his death. He said, do this in remembrance of me. And it's a very simple ceremony. Now the Passover had another important lesson to teach. During the Old Testament Passover ceremony, a lamb was slain. And the early Christians understood this lamb to represent Christ's sacrifice and death. In the first chapter of the book of John, we find this. John the Baptist publicly on two different occasions referring to Jesus as the Lamb of God. Further, the prophetic book of Revelation, chapter 5, verse 6, describes Jesus as a lamb as though it had been slain. And finally, and most importantly, the apostle Paul puts the capstone on the argument when he refers to Jesus as Christ our Passover in 1 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 7. But does the fact that the early church did not keep Easter mean Christians shouldn't observe it today? Again, how would Christ feel about today's observance of Easter? Here's an indication from Jeremiah chapter 10, verses 2 and 3. Do not learn the ways of the nations, for the customs of the peoples are worthless. Many times God warned his people about adopting customs and practices that may have seemed innocent, but would actually corrupt them. God wants his people to be consistent and observe what he says. Speaking very plainly, he says this in Deuteronomy chapter 12 and verse 32. Whatever I command you, be careful to observe it. You shall not add to it nor take away. It's important that we realize that Easter as a church tradition was added. 
What's more, it didn't appear until almost a century after Christ's death. Following the death and resurrection of Jesus, the disciples, particularly Paul, Timothy, and Barnabas, began traveling extensively and teaching to the north and west of Judea. Most of the recorded travels of Paul took place in Greek-speaking Gentile Asia Minor, in what is now known as Turkey. But why is this important to the discussion of Easter? Because Asia Minor became the center of a major controversy over observance of Easter. It was there that early New Testament church practice was maintained through Paul and other apostles and evangelists of the time. Here's what Paul wrote in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verses 23 through 25, to the church at Corinth about 20 years after Christ's death. For I received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it, and said, Take, eat. This is my body, which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same manner, he also took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. This do, as often as you drink it, in remembrance of me. No mention of Easter, as we've seen. The apostles simply didn't teach Easter. They, in fact, taught the annual holy days prescribed in the only scriptures they had, the Old Testament. And the New Testament is very clear on this. Paul himself taught this same Gentile congregation at Corinth to keep the Feast of Unleavened Bread, which, as we've read, is associated with the Passover. 1 Corinthians 5, 8 says this, Therefore, let us keep the Feast, the Feast of Unleavened Bread, not with old leaven, nor the leaven of malice and wickedness, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. The Passover occurred on the same date every year, the 14th of the Hebrew month Nisan, which corresponds to our March-April. Henry Chadwick, a biblical scholar and historian, confirms this in his work, The Early Church. The churches of Asia Minor, the area where Paul and the other early followers of Christ taught, had preserved the most ancient of all methods of determining the date. They simply kept it at the same time as the Jewish Passover, on the 14th day of the Jewish month, Nisan. There was no question in the first several decades after Christ's resurrection that the 14th of Nisan was the commonly accepted date for the Christian Passover. It was only later, when Easter celebrations became fixed around Good Friday and Easter Sunday, that confusion arose. But you know, the Good Friday Easter Sunday tradition poses another problem, because Christ firmly stated that he would be in the grave for three days and three nights. And there aren't three days and three nights between Friday afternoon and Sunday morning. A lot of people have wondered about that, and I'll be explaining this seeming contradiction in the second half of today's program. Before we get to that, I want to offer some free publications to help you further understand what we're covering today. This free booklet, The Plain Truth About Easter, explains in greater detail how we arrived at the modern day Easter celebration. As we've already seen, many of the customs and traditions surrounding Easter have no basis in the Bible. The Plain Truth About Easter is a summary of Easter observances, some dating back many centuries before the birth of Christ. Sometimes we continue practices from generation to generation without really realizing where they come from or what they originally symbolized. You need to read this eye-opening booklet to get the whole story. It explains from both history and the Bible what the early church believed and practiced and what eventually happened to those original beliefs. And I'd also like to offer you, free of charge and without any obligation, this companion publication, The Resurrection Was Not on Sunday. Now, this material may at first shock many of you, but it's straight out of the Bible. This booklet shows in clear, understandable language the events of the last few days before Christ's death and the remarkable days that followed. Along with these free booklets, if you're not already a subscriber, we'll be sending you a free trial subscription to The Plain Truth magazine, a magazine of understanding. You may have The Plain Truth for as long as you like, with no cost to you whatsoever. The Plain Truth deals with world news and current events from a biblical perspective. These publications are all free in the public interest, so please don't hesitate to request them. 
I'll be offering them again at the end of today's program. Well, let's take the story of Easter a little further. Perhaps you didn't know that history also tells us that Easter Sunday worship didn't even begin at Rome until almost a century after Christ's death. According to early church historian Eusebius, the Bishop of Rome, Zistus or Sixtus, was the first to officially celebrate Easter on Sunday. Zistus was Bishop of Rome from 119 to 126 AD. And here's another important fact. A few years later, when the Easter custom began to take hold in Rome, some Christians strongly objected. A leading minister named Polycarp, who'd been taught personally by the Apostle John, traveled to Rome to persuade the bishop there to stop observing Easter. They met about 155 AD, and the early church father Irenaeus wrote this about the meeting. For neither could Anicetus, the Roman bishop, persuade Polycarp not to observe it, the Passover, because he had always observed it with John, the disciple of our Lord, and the rest of the apostles with whom he associated. And neither did Polycarp persuade Anicetus to observe the Passover, who said that he was bound to maintain the practice of the presbyters before him. The controversy only grew more heated. A contemporary of Irenaeus and Polycarp named Polycrates was the leading minister at Ephesus in Asia Minor. He also objected to the proposed replacement of Passover with Easter. Writing about this to Bishop Victor of Rome, he said, As for us, we scrupulously observe the exact day, neither adding nor taking away. And referring to the apostles Philip and John, and Polycarp and other ministers in Asia Minor, Polycrates emphasized this. These all kept the Passover on the 14th day of the month in accordance with the gospel, without ever deviating from it, but keeping to the rule of faith. Those church members who continued to observe the Christian Passover and not Easter became known as the Quartodecimans because they kept to the biblical date of the 14th of Nisan, Quarto meaning four and Deci meaning 10. 4 plus 10 is 14, so 14th of Nisan, and hence the name Quarto Deciman. What faced the church was no small matter. This was the major controversy of the century. About 197 AD, Victor, the Roman bishop, excommunicated Polycrates and other Christians in Asia Minor because they held to the teaching of Christ and the apostles. Finally, in 325 AD, the Emperor Constantine summoned a theological council at Nicaea to settle the matter. There were still believers, even more than a century after Victor, observing the Christian Passover on the 14th of Nisan. They simply wouldn't give up. But the Council of Nicaea unanimously ruled that the now well-developed Easter celebration should always occur on a Sunday. But even with the new ruling, the Quadrodecimans still held fast to the original truth given them. According to authorities, their descendants were still faithful as late as the 9th century AD. Henry Chadwick makes this interesting comment in the early church. There can be little doubt that the Quadrodecimans were right in thinking that they had preserved the most ancient and apostolic custom. They had become heretics simply by being behind the times. Behind the times according to men, yes, but not according to God. Because as Polycrates told Victor of Rome, quoting Acts 5 and verse 29, we ought to obey God rather than men. So as an honest review of history clearly shows, Easter worship on Sunday is a man-made celebration, significantly different from the biblical commands and traditions of the original disciples. Now there's one more important prevailing tradition that I want to discuss today. And that is that Christ died on Good Friday and was resurrected early Sunday morning. Believe it or not, that idea isn't in the New Testament either. But it's only by understanding the importance of the 14th of Nisan that we can reach the truth of the matter. When did the 14th of Nisan fall during the year of Christ's crucifixion? All the evidence you can assemble leads to Wednesday in 31 AD. Now let me show you from the Bible what really happened. During Jesus' ministry, he was asked for a sign to confirm that he was indeed the prophesied Christ, the Anointed One. We read this in Matthew 12, verses 39 and 40. Jesus answered and said to them, 
an evil and adulterous generation seeks after a sign, and no sign will be given to it except the sign of the prophet Jonah. For as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of the great fish, so will the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. Notice that Jesus said that the only sign that he was the long-expected Savior of the world would be his burial for three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. Now, the problem is immediately obvious. As I said earlier, no matter how you count it, there simply aren't three days and three nights between a Friday afternoon crucifixion and a Sunday morning resurrection. All Friday night is one night. The daytime of Saturday is one day, and Saturday night makes two nights. You have only one day and two nights. That isn't three days and three nights. Now, here's the full theological impact of this. Even if the Friday to Sunday sequence were true, it would mean from Jesus' own words that he wasn't the Christ. If you're a Christian and you're celebrating Good Friday and Easter Sunday in the belief that it confirms Christ's Messiahship, then you're talking about a different Christ than Jesus Christ. Under the Friday to Sunday scenario, Christ couldn't have fulfilled his own condition of three days and three nights. Now, some would like to argue that the expression three days and three nights used by Jesus could mean parts of three days, not literally 72 hours. But neither the Hebrew text of the Old Testament nor the Greek writings of the New will support this. What's more, Jesus himself defined how long a day was in John chapter 11, verses 9 and 10. Jesus answered, are there not 12 hours in the day? Now, he's giving a definition of a day. There are 12 hours in a daylight portion of a whole day. If anyone walks in the day, he does not stumble. But he says in the next verse, if one walks in the night, he stumbles. So here Jesus is talking about a daytime period and a nighttime period, each 12 hours in length, making up a whole day. So three daytime periods and three nighttime periods equal 72 hours. It's clear then, the common tradition that Jesus was crucified on Friday afternoon and buried just before sunset and then arose Sunday morning, just about sunrise, can't be true. So let's sum up what really happened and give you the story that fits precisely with all of the biblical accounts. Christ kept the Passover on a Tuesday evening, the 14th of Nisan. On Wednesday afternoon, he died and was put in the tomb right around sunset. His body remained in the tomb all through the next day, corresponding to our Thursday. This Thursday was a very special day. It was one of God's annual holy days, the first day of unleavened bread. On the day after, Friday, spices and ointments were purchased and prepared for Christ's burial. It was prohibited to do so on the annual holy day. Luke 23 and verse 56 tells us that women prepared spices and fragrant oils and they rested on the Sabbath according to the commandment. Then, after the weekly Sabbath on Saturday, the women came early Sunday morning before sunrise and found the tomb empty. And when was Jesus resurrected? Let's look at John's account of this in John chapter 20 and verse 1. On the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene came to the tomb early, while it was still dark, and saw that the stone had been taken away from the tomb. Notice that it was when it was still dark and the tomb was empty. Even before sunrise Sunday morning, the resurrection had already taken place. Now let's go over the sequence of events once more to make it absolutely clear. Jesus died late on the day of the Passover, a Wednesday afternoon, and he was buried at about sunset. Now let's count the days and nights Jesus was in the grave. All Wednesday night is one period. All day Thursday is one daylight period. All Thursday night is now two nights. All day Friday is two days. Friday night is three nights. Daylight Saturday completes three days. About sunset, Saturday evening then, was the time that Jesus rose from the tomb after three days and three nights, just as he said. So here was the proof that Christ was the Savior of the world and the Messiah who would open the way to salvation for all humanity. 
Now, I'm sure this comes as a total surprise to many of you, and I'm out of time to explain further today, but this free booklet, The Resurrection Was Not on Sunday, gives much more detail than I've had time for. It answers a lot of other issues and questions that come from looking into the three days and three nights proof of Christ. Please don't just take my word for it that the Friday to Sunday sequence won't work. Request your free copy of this booklet and see for yourself how plain and true the biblical account is. While you're at it, also request this free booklet, The Plain Truth About Easter. As we saw during the program, many Easter customs from rabbits and eggs to Sunday observance are the result of human tradition. The Plain Truth About Easter will help you see how Easter celebrations developed over the centuries and how different they are from what the original Christians observed. Together with these two booklets, we'll be sending you a free subscription to The Plain Truth magazine if you're not already a subscriber. The Plain Truth is dedicated to providing useful, relevant information and helping people cope and be successful in this modern world. Now, we've nothing to sell on the World Tomorrow program. All of our publications are yours, free of charge. No cost, no obligation whatsoever. We're simply not going to ask you for money. So for a free subscription to The Plain Truth and these free booklets, The Plain Truth About Easter and The Resurrection Was Not on Sunday, please telephone for the cost of a local call, 008-074-222. That's 008-074-222. We have many operators waiting, but if you don't get through right away, call us again in 10 to 15 minutes. That's 008-074-222. If you'd prefer to write, then please address your letters to The World Tomorrow, GPO Box 345, Sydney, New South Wales, 2001. That's The World Tomorrow, GPO Box 345, Sydney, New South Wales, 2001. Next week, we'll continue our look at the events surrounding Christ's death and resurrection. And be prepared for more surprises. For thousands of years, people waited for the Messiah to appear. Many prophecies had to be fulfilled by him. Was Christ really the anointed one, or was he part of a clever hoax? There's some startling evidence about Christ's qualifications to be savior of the world. Don't miss next week's sequel, What Easter Doesn't Tell You. Thank you for joining us today. I'm David Hume for The World Tomorrow. For the free literature offered on this program, write The World Tomorrow, GPO Box 345, Sydney, New South Wales, 2001. Or for the cost of a local call, please telephone 008-074-222. That's The World Tomorrow, GPO Box 345, Sydney, New South Wales, 2001. Or for the cost of a local call, please telephone 008-074-222. The preceding program and all literature were produced and sponsored by the Worldwide Church of God.